There we go. So welcome everyone to uh, Mutation's new year, new time. Uh, just a nice little end of year event for us to converge and reflect and anticipate, maybe even sense into uh, the emergent future, um, a regenerative future, I hope. But yeah, uh, for those of you who are new to mutations or have recently come into the fold, um, uh, we tend to meet for these monthly sessions where we explore a particular subject around integral thinking, integral philosophy, practice, spirituality, um, and reflect on our current moment in, in cultural evolution. Uh, we tend to emphasize the aesthetic, the artistic, the experiential, but we don't shy away from the intellectual and philosophical, of course. So yeah, th this month particularly has been a, a month particularly for me, of, of intensification. Uh, the Cynthia, Cynthia Bourgeau, our conversations have really picked up. We plan on having a, a good chat in the new year. Uh, just had another recent chat with Paul Smith of Integral Christianity. There's some interesting contemplative dimensions sort of, I didn't even seek them out, but they seem to be kind of coalescing around this community and I'm really appreciating that. Um, and, and in general, I think this year has been a year for what Gepser would call uh, intensifications. Uh, and I, I want to lean into this for this particular session because intensification is a weird word. Um, it's a poetic word. You hear it and you go, yeah, this year has been a year of intensifications. What does that mean? Let's unpack it, right? It's both intellectual and I think it's also something a bit more immediate, um, something that we can actually feel into. Uh, a felt sense. And, and if there's anything that's really come into the forefront with our community, it's this sense of uh, trusting that felt sense and being in a particular space, communal space here, uh, where we have the space to explore that safely. Uh, and also, you know, in, in a sense of, you know, mutual learning and mutual intelligence. So I've just really appreciated our our explorations as the world has been exploding and blowing blowing apart and blowing open um, and breaking down at the same time communities like this like mutations um not the only one by far but these community these communication networks have been exploding as well and intensifying and i found that to be a very interesting um beneficial element of of, of what has happened this year so i just want to welcome you all uh, at the end and perhaps at the beginning of these intensifications, hopefully more regenerative. And let's let's kind of just go around. We normally do a check-in, but maybe for today's check-in, it, it could be more of um, th this question. Um, what intensified for us? How do we understand that word in the context of this year, which is now concluding? And what do we hope to see in the new year or what do we feel what do we sense that is emerging in the new year uh, it's a big question but maybe if we can keep it for uh, down to you know a minute or two per response so anybody want to jump in yeah in an attempt uh let's see veronica yes thank see you what... yeah um <laughs> Uh, hello to you all. I want to congratulate Jeremy <laughs> for his um, coming publications. So, and thank him, of course, for his presence. Um, to me, the word intensification has a very positive meaning. Um, and uh, it really reconfirmed in very practical terms uh, the uh, unity, uh, the um, practical aspects of oneness and unity uh, camaraderie as we're experiencing right now. What my um, feeling, I would say, for the coming year in terms of what could happen, a start or maybe a hint of it, would be something that came to my mind when I was reading, actually, Jeremy, I reread your article, and it's on the last page, uh, page nine, when you're saying, uh, and I'll make that very short, uh, even for those of us who are an artist, but metamodernist and integralist of some sort, have an imperative to cultivate an artist's sensibility 
and become attentive to the present. And to me, it brought to mind what I call in my own little mind, the art of crafting, that we can use uh, our imagination. And we already do. Um, you know, we make clothing, but textile out of broken glass and, and it, it, we, can, we can build buildings. We could do things as a craft. And this is what I hope will show up again because it would, of course, go back all the way to day one of humankind and having this artistic feeling and creativity of crafting with our mind and hands. That's it. Oh, beautiful, beautiful. I get the image as you're saying is that's a great expression of, of, of regeneration in the sense of, you know, picking up the pieces of a world of a fallen world and, and assembling out of those pieces, a shape of the future, right? That it, it shows up um, to use a Philip K. Dick uh, aphorism, you know, the God shows up in the trash stratum in the sense of like the things that fall apart where the cracks in, in our reality is actually what, where that can shine through. So beautiful, beautiful image. Thank you, Veronica. Um, I don't really want to lean into this question, this inquiry of intensification and, and, and what is emerging. And uh, feel free as well, if you're new here, uh, you can raise your hand. There's a little raise your hand button. And uh, certainly you could just type in the chat as well and say, hey, I'd like to jump in here. Um, did I see Rachel? Did you raise your hand? I, I thought maybe you raised. Yeah. You're welcome to. <laughs> you don't have to, but <laughs> that's OK. Um, Adrian's saying, for, for me, polarity, living the opposites has intensified, and so has the feeling of co-creation with reality, that the outer is reflecting the inner, but also there is still a trauma response. That's interesting. You know, this year has been, you know, we're, we're, speaking of intensifications, um, uh, the, this word is not a, an entirely positive word. It, there it implied an intensification uh, as another concept that Gebser uses quite a bit, which is eruption with an I. Um, an eruption implicates a kind of breaking open process, which can be very painful. Uh, a birthing process, birth trauma, for instance, in, in that context. Um, so there's certainly a, a sense in which this year has has really kind of broken open the foundations of... of uh, or even kind of revealed to us that those foundations have already been broken and have been over for some time. You know, there's a kind of um, unsheltering that I think has been taking place, um, especially for the the sense making of modernity. You know, um, there's a sense that like we've been in a little eggshell and it's cracked open now. And so, what do we do with the real? You know, uh, Judith, love to hear from you. Oh, let's see, you are muted. Let me ask to unmute you. There you go. Oh, just I just wanted to um, to punctuate eruption because it felt to me, speaking of the felt intensification, leaning into the new year, um, the eruption of Hale Ma'oma'u on the Kilauea crater, which is a which is a lava lake. It has. Um, it has erupted and it occurred at 1030 on the night before the, the evening before, I mean here Hawaii time, the evening before the solstice and living here and having that happen right here on our island for me was just total validation of the intensification of the planet, planetization of what's occurring. And that because we personalize the, the volcano goddess here uh, as Pele, that in particular, the feminine has spoken. And um, is, her voice is, is added. It, it, uh, there's an intensification of her voice on the planet right now. And that that was an augury of coming from origin. Wow, Judith, uh, you know, speaking of Adrian's comment on, on the inner and the outer, right? What an event to occur that seems to be simultaneously both 
Um, that's fascinating. Thank you. Uh, I, yeah, I just I, I, I just want to add that it's so it's so in, um, the land here is so alive because of Pele and <clears throat> and the um, you know the prim primordial feel here of a of, of a land always birthing itself, continuously birthing itself. Um, it, the volcano isn't just something happening on one side of the island. It, it ripples through us. It's, we, be, we, are, we become here. I mean, even people that, that would never understand what we're talking about, they feel it. They don't know how to articulate, but, but people here um, acquiesce to Pele. Mm. Always have and always will. It's just how it is to live on a living being, you know, a, a, a being that's living and expressing. You know, in that context, I wonder um, what kind of, I mean, I don't, I don't wish for it, but I know that this century is a century of those kind of eruptions, whether volcanic or otherwise, by mm -hmm. the, the planet, by the biosphere, the living biosphere. And what context would it take? What what kind of eruption? What kind of intensification would it take for the whole Earth community to respect the living being that we participate in and and cohabitate with and are here because of? Right? I mean, it's such a wonderful. When, I guess what I'm saying is, is uh, you're sharing is such a, a wonderful reflection of how we all, all ought to be in relation to the Earth, right? Which is getting a little intensified right now with the uh, the virus uh the first of all and then with what we're already kind of in the midst of um the hyper object of climate change you know uh, that's only going to intensify and what um how much better would we be if we had that kind of respect right in relationship with the uh, with the earth but um thank you judith and we'd want to jump on mic let me just check our chat here Adrian saying, yeah, the photos of the eruption were amazing. Um, anybody want to unmute and do a little sharing? Uh, how do you understand intensification? And, and uh, how do, can you sense into what is emerging, what is latent in these intensifications? Well, a theme I've noticed is the, uh, is the intensification of the conflict between the individual self and the co and collective identity. There's a lot of uh, people out there who I call toxic individuals currently decrying uh, basic safety measures like uh, wearing masks and staying at home and even vaccinations. And on the other hand, there are people saying that individualism is just yes, completely wrong and we should be completely consigned to the collective form. I have attempted to formulate, well, not really formulate because it's not really my solution, but I've attempted to uh, to bring out um, a solution that was devised by the philosopher Gilles Deleuze, which is uh, the individual. Um, I've sort of attempted to promote that a bit as a good negotiation between these two poles um, as the, uh, as I think the self should be informed by our rights as singular people, um, but simultaneously by our responsibilities to each other as a society and to the biosphere as, you know, living beings that take resources from it and should probably give back to it. <laughs> yeah, well, well said, Moses. Uh, good, to, good to see you here. I. Uh... Yeah, I mean, just just uh, in, I'm in agreement with that. Um, it, it reminds me of that that Kim Stanley Robinson article from the New Yorker, where he's talking about like we are societies, but like every individual is a society made of societies, just in terms of the the organisms that constitute a single human being is is a is an ecosystem essentially. And so, what happens to our paradigm when we really begin to take that seriously? And and how does the individuality of of you know our our cultural sense making, which is really really kind of overemphasizing our separateness, uh, relate to that 
paradigm shift. This is a whole new worldview, as 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 Robinson says. This is this is groundbreaking. This is a new worldview. What do we do with this? And I think in this year, in the, in the context of this year, has really kind of highlighted that, especially in this context of social responsibility. Um, how do we cooperate for the benefit of the whole, but also for the individual? Right. I'm, I'm thinking as well of. Uh, I've been saying this a lot this year and Michael Brooks had a different way of, of had a version of this, but it's from star Trek and it's the needs of the many outweigh the needs of the few. And then it flips around though, where Kirk says to Spock, uh, you know, why did you sacrifice your career in Starfleet to rescue me, et cetera. And he said, well, because the needs of the one outweigh the needs of the many, you know, everyone coming together to sacrifice. So, so there's this kind of mutuality of, um, support of the one and the many and the many and the one that I think is just really highlighted this year, even if it's a lesson culturally that, you know, we may have failed at more than we succeeded. I think the the clarity of that lesson has at least intensified for me and I'm hearing that from you as well. Um, if you'll yeah. permit me to, fli uh, to flip it, I think yeah. we succeeded more than we failed. Mm. Maybe, maybe not so much for the environment, but certainly for each other. There are a lot more people wearing masks and, and yes. caring for our social workers and all of that good stuff than not. Like yeah. the people who protest against the masks are a minority. That's important mm -hmm. to remember. That. that is, yeah, and it's a very good point. Uh, the uh, and one of the things that you've heard heard me like hammer on about all year is is uh, the Michelle Bowen's line of. Uh, this being a pedagogical catastrophe. And, and that I think, you know, that's a good example. We're learning, we're learning um, where we don't have what it takes yet. And then also what we need to do collectively, like just to succeed and survive and flourish as a, as a species, you know, that is globally interconnected. Um, obviously there's a, it's a big learning curve. It's very steep, but I think, that example is a good one that, oh, okay, we can adapt, actually. We don't have to keep going the way we've been going. We can change. Um, and, you know, in terms of intensifications, these are opportunities, I think, to, to really learn that we can change, that things are not stable, that the volcano does erupt and the land does restructure and reshape more often than we may be comfortable with socially, ecologically, etc. So, we could flow with that we can move with that or or not but i think more of us are learning like hey it's okay actually um that's that's my optimistic view on it though but i do think um regenerative culture as an idea as a concept and then as a sort of again a felt sense that this needs to start occurring um and 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 uh permeating culture more um is really taking hold um so i'm i'm holding on to that but uh okay Let's see. Uh, Judith was saying the needs of the whole and the needs of each each one are interdependent. There's a mutuality in that. Um, uh, again, I, I love that phrase, just how you can kind of, it's like a uh, infinity loop, right? An infinity eight of the one and the many and the many and the one. Um, I've been going back to that a lot. Uh, let's see, Connie, would you like to jump in? Yeah, just to kind of uh, piggyback on what Judith said and and what's going on in in, uh, in my part of the world. Uh, first of all, we also live on an, um, an ever awakening part of the earth with our earthquakes. And I think it's interesting that, um, <clears throat> you know, those of us who live here, just, we do, we just adapt to that. We just know that's gonna happen. And we, we, we live with that reality. Um, I think it's harder for people to like merge with Gaia concepts. If your act of God is a hurricane or a tornado, that doesn't seem as earthy, <laughs> right? As a volcano or, a, or an earthquake, but it's, um, there's that. And then there's also in terms of this flipping back and forth between needs of the one and needs of the many. So right now, Los Angeles is like, the king of, of COVID. I mean, we're putting beds in gift shops in hospitals. We're putting beds in chapels in hospitals. We're putting beds in parking lots in hospitals. We are, people are waiting hours in an ambulance just to get inside the hospital. It's crazy here. Our 
our um, you know positive rate is somewhere around 20 percent it's just crazy here so i sense and i've been sensing this all year that my um personal right is the right to stay healthy and that flips around and contributes to the collective i'm not taking a hospital bed because i'm staying healthy I'm not giving hospitality to the virus. That feeds my needs. That also feeds the collective needs. We live in a, in a canyon and there are probably, I'm gonna say maybe 200 households in this canyon. We're very diverse uh, in terms of skin color and religious practices and that kind of thing up here in this canyon. But also not one person in our entire canyon has uh, has had COVID because we are doing that for and with each other. So it's interesting that the that the the argument for people who don't want to wear masks is something about personal rights, but they seem to forget their personal right to stay healthy. <laughs> so th that's the way it flips back and forth in intensification for me. Yeah, I I think um. A lesson from this uh, is speaking of hurricanes and, and the kind of manifestations of the planetary that are a bit more in our face and maybe not as nice as, you know, commuting in a, in a pretty natural environment. Um, I, I, I don't think the planet, when it comes down to it, especially this year, supports the kind of atomized culture uh that are that are you know are the history of you know modernity in the present at least leading up to right now with atomization neoliberal you know consumerism that kind of attitude is not an attitude the planet supports ultimately and i think this year and speaking of intensifications it started to just cut through that it doesn't allow that to continue and i think the more we we, we the planet won't destroy that it just it just won't allow it to continue if that makes sense i mean i, I think the intensifications will really kind of pull the uh the support structures out from under that kind of attitude and it will be a lesson that we'll have to learn probably the hard way um and that you know you can't continue like that you can't continue to build a culture or civilization in mass like that without um a more painful path right a more desperately painful path without more suffering and hopefully what will win out though is is you know this release or surrender of atomization um and alienation and, and, a, and a and a move towards solidarity and compassion right like i don't want to perpetuate the suffering right i don't want to perpetuate the uh d destruction of our of our life world um and other beings life worlds but how how intensified that has to become for us to realize that I don't know, but I, I don't think this is necessarily a separate lesson from, you know, like traditional Christian or Buddhist teachings about compassion and empathy. I think it just extends now to the planet and the non-human world. Um, uh, let's see, Veronica, did you want to chime in there? And oh, I see Richard af after Richard. Let's let's get you, uh, uh, Veronica, and then Richard. Sorry. <laughs> I'm sorry. Oh, that's very quickly. Uh, I love the quote you have on page six from um, Lynn Margulis. We cannot put an end to nature. We can only pose a threat to ourselves. But it, isn't it the case that um, the quest for meaning, which is apparently inherent to, um, to our species, is based on a totally wrong foundation. So that might be the reason why people in cases of emergency like now, go back to a, it's inevitably want meaning, but they don't have the foundation for finding the right kind of meaning. That's a great question. Um, I, I think that's true. I think there's a sense of law, like being lost right, right. now. like. The, the sense of not having ground to stand on is is not 
really being reattuned to what, what actually makes meaning, you know, coming together as, a, you know, a living community with the commons in relationship with the earth and developing localization. The answers are immediately ready in terms of like regenerative cultural praxis that we need to start experimenting with and everything. But that there's a gap between that and the communities that are doing that. And I think, and the general sense of loss like listlessness like where do we go from here this thing isn't going to be allowed to continue the machine you know th there's a kind of a vanishing point for our culture and there's this deep sense of well if there's no way forward and there's no way back where do we go um and maybe you know i i don't have obviously an, a, a, an immediate or direct answer to that but i think that's the inquiry that we really need to explore, which is how do we cultivate a re more regenerative culture? How does this, you know, I, I hate to use the word like a, um, a more technical word scale, but in a sense, like, how do we reach people? How do we shift the culture? How do we allow regenerative practices to really take root or take hold to use a biological metaphor, um, which, you know, this is brings loops in with Gebser again, which is intensification. He says, it's not about quantity, it's about the intensification of uh, those who live the new. And so again, we come back to that question. How do we- Yeah, and it's the it? contraction versus the expansion, like the breath, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. which is, you know, the breath of COVID. It's trying yeah. to expand the breath, not contract. Yeah. It has been a year of, of uh, breathing metaphors. <laughs> yeah. um, let, let me jump to, to Richard, if that's okay, because Richard was, and then I'll go to Tom. Yeah, I, um, I'm thinking of this conversation about atomization, individuality, going back to what what Moses said, what many have said. Um, I don't, I don't read the people who are vociferously against mask wearing as acting as atomized individuals in any way. I mean, it's a there's a real tribal and collective <laughs> at work there. I, I perceive it more as people are having a hard time accepting reality, the reality of this. They, they think it's a conspiracy or they think it's a governmental effort to control them or they think it's a plot of liberals or whatever they may think it is. And I don't, it's the same with climate change. I think we're having a real, collective problem discerning the reality of climate change discerning the reality of a of a of a virus um and so i you know I, I might just leave it at there i think it's a not so much a question of collective versus individual um atomization as it is a a a, a, a a big problem in both domains of perceiving what the reality is. Yeah, if that makes if, yeah. yeah, if it makes if it makes any sense, I don't I don't have an, you know, I read all of the things about. Um, I make a point of reading not stupid stuff, but people who believe that this whole virus is another step towards you know one world government and 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 control and so on and so forth of making making the citizens who are unruly and kind of stupid you know toe a line you know like uh many see this as related to things like the world economic forum you know which is very much a an, an entity that sees the world a certain way and wants everybody to behave that way right so i and i see the logic of that what I don't see is how that actually relates to a deadly virus that's sweeping the world, you know? So again, I come back to this point of, uh, do we have a problem uh, not only seeing, but agreeing what a reality is? Yeah, yeah, yeah. And I think that that speaks to the uh, deep sense. And I do think it is atomization in, in the sense of, uh, the the perspective of a world no longer being able to generate a shared consensus or a shared sense of world anymore. It's it's that kind of perspectival uh, dissolution into smaller and smaller. Uh, Robert Anton Wilson would say reality tunnels in the sense of you know 
this is our totalizing reality and this is your totalizing reality and we don't need to agree you know there are other facts there are alternative facts right so there's this hyper fragmentation of the world a sort of shattering of a shared sense that the world has always been multi multiplicitous but this shattering this inability for us to kind of find mutual ground i think is it's is more of speaking to that sense of atomization as a cultural whole um and maybe you know as a secondary uh contributing factor uh neoliberal atomization as a sort as a source of unhealthy tribalization as gepser talks about we reel from total alienation to mass movements that might not be constructive or healthy but a kind of you know oscillation back and forth between being alienated and then moving into a kind of an unhealthy collective right so there's that kind of ping-ponging or oscillation effect that i think is um in effect here but yeah i think uh, you know it's it's important that you're hitting home about the the lack of a shared consensus a shared world that's bruno latour's point in, in his in his recent writings as well um, well and i don't think that's a new problem um you know if you look at it historically we've always had people living in a in another tribal world and and uh you know just i live in north carolina maybe these things are more visible in North Carolina than they would be in some places that people may live. But the, when you see people behaving aggressively on behalf of a point, you almost never see them alone. You always see them in a group, <laughs> you know? <laughs> so I'm not saying it's not atomized. I'm saying I'm not, I'm not sure it is at the level of an individual. The individual puts him or herself into the tribe that they've they've grown up in or want to belong to. I guess that's what I'm trying to say. But meanwhile, the reality has nothing to do with that. The reality has a virus out of control or the reality has the planet burning up, you know? Yeah, yeah. Uh, let's, let's, go to, let's go to Tom. I know Tom is biting at the bit to jump in about the regenerative uh, mention. So I'm gonna speak from the other side in many ways. Um, my experience, especially the last three months increasingly, has been to be part of amazing collectives, the Warm Data Training Group, your group, um, the collective presencing, which I just discovered of Rayo. And it's amazing to me what's happening. And, and COVID is about the most benign thing that could have come along to, to stop things and say, look at what's happening. Um, so, so, and I'm also gonna speak from the other side in terms of this project I have that is suddenly just flowing amazingly well. Um, I wasn't aware of the term until a few months ago, I think Jeremy threw some post of yours about a year ago and forgot about it, the term solar punk, which for those who don't know, is kind of the opposite of this dystopian future bullshit we've had for 30 years that has played itself out, as you were talking about, Jeremy. And so it basically is a genre of fiction that starts, is kind of based in the present, but then also includes a future of could be 10, 20, 60, 100 years in the future that is a positive vision of a regenerative world that post post collapse if there's a collapse or just a transition to a sustainable regenerative world and um so i'll just say really briefly so i had this idea first as a book and now um television series i, I live in albuquerque and netflix is now based here and they're about to double the size of their studio there have been since Breaking Bad and before, uh, everything needed to do amazing work is here. Uh, I'll try to be pretty brief here. So there's a young Hispanic girl that I had a violin and there's a little foundation that gives instruments to people who can't afford them. And uh, Metzli was on the board of this little group. And so she couldn't accept, uh, get one through them. And her sister, is one of the stars of the film that 
came out and got shown twice and now won't be available for about a month, uh, Lady of Guadalupe. And long story short, uh, I have already talked to the writer director of that and he's interested in possibly working on this project. He's already going to download Integral Vision. Now I'm going to <laughs> recommend your book and uh, Nora's book, which I haven't even read yet. It's in the mail. So I just want to say there's amazing things going on right now. And uh, the working title, <laughs> just in case you, it comes to come some kind of fruition, is, is uh, Angus Always Already. Oh. For short. Hopefully it'll be bigger than GOT. <laughs> um, that's it for now. Oh, I, I wish you all the best with that. Please keep me posted. Oh, I'm that. going to mm. include you as much as you have time oh. for. <laughs> awesome. Awesome. Uh, looking forward to hearing more. Uh, but I think you're right. Your point about the, the kind of amazing rhizomatic intensifications of all of these different communities, not just the gathering and the speaking. I think it's, it's a result of that kind of fellowship that has popped up everywhere, but also the fruits of those fellowships in terms of like what people are producing, the things that they are creating with each other now, uh, the writing and the literature. I mean, even in my circles, like, you know, what we've been doing with the mutations community um, and the ex sort of extended network of publishing that I've been working on between Perspectiva and, uh, and now with Revelor and Integral Imprint, um, I've been working with Sean Kelly's book, uh, which is really a, a philosophical book, and it's literally called Becoming Gaia, uh, and it's exploring this period as planetary initiation. And there's so much great, and I'm not just meaning like people aren't just talking about it, there's great literature, there's an intensification of processing this, there's practices that are emerging. Um, even in the STOA, we had a great session yesterday uh, talking with them. Um, uh, a, a few folks uh, who were in the sense who were in the sense making community, um, and just like the what we produced out of that conversation, you can watch it. I'll, I'll link to it. Um, it's very promising, just in terms of creating a sort of uh, database, um, sort of an intentionality of historical literacy about uh, movements like this, right? Particular intentional communities, eco spiritual gatherings and events that have been going on since the 50s, 60s, 70s, even beforehand. And just having that historical literacy to enrich and inform how to navigate the present, how to avoid some of the shortcomings, uh, the difficulties of the past. So that's even generating. I find that to be such a mature response to this year. Um, anyway, I, I, I share your, you know, uh, to resonate with maybe what Sean is writing about in, or wrote about in um, Becoming Gaia, I don't know how well we're going to get through this event with a capital E of deep adaptation. I don't know how successful we will be at avoiding the level of the capacity of suffering, the capacity of, of, of loss, which we might in, have to endure this century in the coming centuries. I don't know, but I have a sense in, in which, as, as Sean talks about, like I know how to live, I know how to be present I know how to live well and die well in this age, right? In the spirit of this age. And so I think more than anything, that clarity gives us a new, a new kind of ground. It's not that sort of static, stable ground of modernity, but it is a living ground. It's more like the warm data that you're learning about with, with, with Nora and her wonderful work. Um, the more we can create spaces for that and intensify that and, and facilitate and host and educate, I think, we, ha we know what our work is, you know, there's so much innovation and creativity that needs to occur, but we have a sense of that latent future. Um, anyway, I'll get off my little podium and uh, let's go to Evan. Hey, Evan, good to see you here. Yeah, good to be here. Sorry, I was late. I, uh, time has been a very weird phenomenon this year, I, I must say. <laughs> but uh, yeah, so um, yeah, that was quite an interesting conversation that we had yesterday and uh, that you were mentioning. And, and I, I mean, it's funny how conversational flows work. I, I, I raised my hand um, when somebody was speaking a little bit ago and, you know, had something on that. And then, of course, you know, uh, conversation moves the way that it will. But I think I can still tie in what came alive for me then to what's been discussed since, which is this 
this sort of tribal splitting and whether it's atomized at the level of individuals, atomized at the level of collectives, you know, all of this stuff. One, one lens I like to bring into this is the lens of, of simulacrum and simulacrum levels, right? Because I think that one of the main drivers of this atomization is that for most people these days and at least advanced industrial societies, speech act are primarily seeming to be acts of signaling tribal allegiance rather than acts of communicating or imparting information about the ground truth reality, right? And, you know, you see this happening on all political sides and spectra. I can't narrow this down and say, oh, this is the, the COVID deniers or the climate deniers or the you know, big government, it's just everybody's doing it. You know, we're all sort of so, sort of doing it. And I, I find it interesting, like say that that conversation we had yesterday, um, you know, uh, we, we kind of started out exploring this sort of very liminal space of like, what is the relationship to not knowing, right? And this could be seen as a fairly like, you know, up the meta hierarchy type conversation where we started. And then, you know, you go, up that level, that, that hierarchy to a certain extent. And there's this really interesting phenomenon I've been noticing in this, this sort of space and all the adjacent community spaces that are working and thinking on this stuff that you go meta enough and you end up sort of recursing down to the ground level, right? You know, we, we ended up grounding ourselves in that conversation with a, an understanding or a shared sense that a deep understanding of, I think the way you put it was material history is so important, um, you know, for moving into the future together. And, and I found this phenomenon, like, I, I'm glad somebody just mentioned um, collective presencing, right? Because this is like, like the uh, material history, yes, but also part of the ground level of reality is this sense of we space or a collective presence that's cultivated and, and things like that. And somebody earlier from that was talking about meaning making um, and, and it having to do with our relationality, with our relationships, you know, and that that's one of the main sources of true meaning. And I just, I don't know, I sense that all these threads sort of weave together in some interesting ways that rather than focusing on signaling our tribal allegiance through our speech acts, there's this seemingly subtle, but I think very important shift to feeling into the felt sense of what it's like to interact with other humans rather than focusing on what I can signal to them and how that might manipulate, you know, the third and fourth simulacrum levels or whatever. And uh, that just, that's really encouraging. And it's something that I think has been, you know, characteristic of some of the earlier efforts um, in, in terms of societal transformation. You saw a lot of this in the hippie movement, you know, 60s, 70s and, and, and beyond, but there was a lack of, um, intellectual rigor in a lot of those spaces, which these spaces seem to be not falling so prey to. And uh, I don't know, I'm just very encouraged by everything that's happening, honestly. And I, I don't think we have any of the solutions um, per se yet, but we, we seem to be working in the right processes, at least that, that, that seems very, uh, very much a reflection that's felt like a shift for me, you know, in the past year, noticing, becoming aware of and participating in these sorts of of communities and efforts. And I'm, I'm very excited to see where this, this collective energy can take us, you know, in the new year and beyond to, uh, mm. you know, to just kind of get in touch with that. <laughs> yes, yes, yes. Uh, in agreement with everything you just said, Evan. Um, and I appreciate us uh, beginning to, to chat more and have these conversations more. I've been really uh, valuing these, these exchanges. Um, yeah, I, I do agree that that, you know, yes, material history, knowledge and literacy is important. But I think what's the subtext or the in between text, the hypertext in that is actually our relation, our new relationality with the community. What are we doing? I mean, by by doing that, what, what was the context that Vinay brought up yesterday it was, we should cultivate relationships with individuals who have a deep knowledge of a particular historical bent, you know, of um, uh, a, a particular study, let's say the whole earth catalog and the history of like the hippie communes and just like having someone, a person, an individuality on board that's participating in the community and is offering something. So there's, um, 
there's a kind of a horizontal sharing. There's a kind of a breaking bread at the table that I think is that the context of that strategy. And the bread may be knowledge, the bread may be a book, the bread may be a lecture, but the the importance is really kind of being present to each other in that way. And I think the 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 way in which that information gets received well is in that context of well, I'm here in in the in the spirit of solidarity, in the spirit of like I feel a sense of us together here. That's why I'm here. That's why I'm showing up and offering this particular gift or fruit or expertise. And that's like I mean that's like the the fundamentals of being as you're saying, being human, being in a community. Um, it's the mutual sharing and helping and assisting and processing, you know, et cetera. But I think that context is deeply important. And you're right. I think that is. When you go meta enough, I've, I've just noticed it's a simultaneous thing that I've seen this year, which is like the meta community just went, oh, we really need to circle back and recursively come back down to the ground. I mean, that's why we created Growing Down podcasts. That's why, uh, you know, even Michael Brooks, uh, we were talking the beginning of uh, this year. Um, he was recommending Bruno Latour to, to folks uh, about you know the Latour's concept of coming down to earth, right? And sort of really even introducing that to the left as like, well, how do we get our hands in the dirt actually in the context of exit strategies or innovations on the left? So it seems to be a theme that is becoming more prevalent. And I really um, appreciate you kind of highlighting that as it's intensification for this year. So thank you, Evan. Um, Let's see, uh, Tom, Tom uh, yeah, Bruno Latour. Um, and the book is just called Down to Earth. It's a short book. I would recommend it as a companion or a follow-up to Ken Wilber's uh, Trump in a Post-Truth World. Um, it talks about the sort of breakdown of a shared world, but also it's, it's philosophical, you know, but he's written a, quite a bit about Gaia. Uh, Facing Gaia is another good book. But it's in that context of politics becoming uh, a sense of shared ground again in the context of deep adaptation. He doesn't use that language, but he's talking about like, we're in for a very difficult century and we're all in it together. So what are we going to end up doing when coastal regions start changing or, you know, bioregions start collapsing like what are people going to do besides panic right how are we going to work through this together the human and the non-human world in that context and I, th that existential intensity he's holding through that book is very very good um so i highly recommend it uh carrie i, I saw you posted some ver something very interesting i didn't get a chance to uh scan it too deeply but would you like to uh, speak about this. I know you're you're commenting on language here. Um, yeah, I think basically um, feeding back to what some other people have said, um, as Philip K. Dick said, the person who controls definitions can control reality because as soon as you say something, someone says, "Oh, but that's what this means," because I can point the official definition, and if there isn't an alternative official definition, things become complicated. And I think also that the casualness of day-to-day -day conversations and the implied ridiculousness of deep conversations on a day-to-day -day level um, means that um, there is this estrangement between people. There's this endless small talk to maintain um, existent human interactions without there being any real change whatsoever. And that's very erosive and it leads to loneliness and it leads to a lack of movement and realness. Um, and the alternative to that is what? I mean, there is a lack of um, taught articulacy in, in, um, in education. Um, I don't think it's really um, encouraged necessarily to be able to communicate um, with depth and or nuance and or detail particularly. Um, and a low level of accomplishment in terms of language is generally seen as okay. Like the standard is pretty low. Imagine if the standard for a language was the same as the standard for maths. It really isn't. And it's maths and spoken or written language aren't necessarily that different in some ways when you're talking about um, some things. Um, but um, 
if people cannot talk about things, they don't have the tools, they don't have the, um, they might have a vague sense of something, but it's very difficult to do anything with that politically or interpersonally unless you can articulate it. And if you articulate it and then everyone says, well, who swallowed a theosaurus, then you don't get anywhere. So um, it's, of course, it's, um, talking about things in basic language, your know, Occam's razor replies, but sometimes you can't go beyond certain points without using language in new or unusual ways is what I would say. Mm -hmm. So uh, perfect point. I, I, this is so important. I love what you wrote to you about, uh, you know, political theorists are needed, but philologists, that's such a, I mean, I think Tolkien would be in agreement there. Um, just thinking in that context, but it, it's also resonant for me because, you know, a, a big part of, of, of what I've been exploring in, in, in our group is, is what Gepser calls the new statement and how can we effectively use new language it doesn't have to be technical it could be poetic language but how do we create new utterances that have an efficacious um, impartation of a new a new sensibility and whether it's a word I'm not just talking about slogans I'm, I mean new ways of expressing and communicating exactly what you're talking about here so as in terms of intensifications I am in wholehearted agreement that we need language to intensify somehow in the context of a, the meta crisis in the context of everything we've been discussing. Is there is there a way to communicate so that that worlding is shared effectively? So it's, I think um, that has certainly been my experience that um, it's necessary to have for me with the type of mind I have symbols and metaphors. So I find that a lot of the hingings and cognitive shifts I've had have been um, when I've talked with people and it's been like, OK, let's imagine this as a mountain or something like that. And then things become less abstract. So I think ways of talking definitely make a difference. The subject of the matter is not necessarily the only thing. It's also the medium and the approach mm -hmm. and what tools to use. Absolutely. Absolutely. Uh, you know, it's, it's funny. Um, the context of this line of inquiry is is very resonant with uh, something that I'm going to be doing with Perspectiva a little bit down the road. Um, but working on fragments of an integral future book right now, but after that, um, I'm going to be wanting to do a book with Perspectiva Press on the planetary. And it's just something Jonathan Rousen has brought up to me quite a bit. And you know, Evo, who's not here, he's a, he's a patron, but we talk about this. Is, you, you mentioned metaphors. Um, what are the what what are ways to impart this artistically aesthetically what are the planetary myths what are the planetary stories what is it what are the structures of those stories look like that impart this new sense of time and help to facilitate uh, a planetary imaginary um so i'm just deeply interested in, in continuing that this line of of inquiry so looking forward to that yeah thank you carrie um adam do you want to jump in Hey everybody, um, I'll say a big amen to every single thing everybody said. Um, I agree with all of it. Uh, the um, Just to mention the intensification, that word's been coming up for me a lot the last week or two, um, both from uh, going back through Jeremy's uh, paper on the planetary and um, just reflecting on what it meant for me, et cetera. And I will say that um, personally, I haven't really, I can I can absolutely see the intensification of consciousness as um, what's happening and, and, and it's happened to me, et cetera. But uh, I don't know that it's always pleasant. I don't know that I've always enjoyed it. Intensification can really be, um, uh, there can be moments where it, it does involve, I think, expansion and that lightens things up. But a lot of times it's just, um, you know, you intensify things when they're in a pressure cooker for instance. Um, so it, you know, uh, just a thought on that. I, I do think Richard is onto something there about, um, and, and I'd call it probably a, a reaction to atomization, but the hyper merging that goes on in our world right now, the hyper uh, collectivist kind of perspective, the, um, uh, 
if you look at cults, if you look at um, whatever language we want to use for people groups with identity, whether it's a brand or a tribe or, or whatever, I think we're, we're, we're hitting the limits of some of these words in, in some ways. Um, a lot of the advantage of it is that there's a package of beliefs that comes together. So instead of wrestling with the complexity of every individual thing you might want to figure out about the world, you can just join this party and here's, you know, how we look at everything and it relieves that pressure um, of negotiating a complex world and it's a big part of what draws people into um, into cults into group identities and uh, also into political parties you know a two-party system is really one of the most absurd collections of ideas and perspectives that just I mean you've got a, you've got two choices your 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 complex world can end up on one of these sides and when you see people, and, and I, I've done it myself, but when you see people looking to create a cohesive set of principles that explains why this group ended up in this one half of the coalition versus the other, it gets to the point of being almost ridiculous. A lot of these coalitions that make up you know, either side of our party have nothing to do with one another um, or they, they're, or they're highly contradictory, but it, it, it alleviates the pressure of exploring and figuring out everything on your own in so many ways. Um, and uh, a lot of the, the hypermerging that goes on, I think is also a reaction. And this is where I think the word tribes doesn't really fit it. The, it we're, Seth Godin talks about this. He said that um, we, we use this word tribe to describe our, you know, allegiance or identity with a group of people, but we're, it doesn't apply because um, we used to be a member of one tribe and now we're members of hundreds, even thousands of overlapping tribal identities. I mean, you're either someone who considers yourself a John Deere mower fan or not simultaneously, you're a member of, you're members of all these different, um, brand allegiances, interests, hobbies, perspectives, the traumas that you've been through. Um, and it's, it's a massive amount of complexity. It's just a massive amount of complexity to try to hold on to. And I don't know that we really evolved with that much complexity. And then touching on what Carrie's talking about, we're trapped in our vocabularies you know, uh, and we're trapped by vocabulary, we're trapped by language itself. And I say this as a writer, so I'm not looking to upset any writers here, but so much of education is um, verbal enculturation. I mean, it's read, 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 read. And it's one means of communicating and it's hit, it hits its limit. I mean, if there's not a word for something, writers will create their own word, but the average person then, it's almost as if that concept sits outside of their ability to access. So I do see the explosion of communication on the internet so visual from visual memes to the rise of emoji to people having entire conversations with GIFs back and forth, stuff like that, as it's, it's um, to try to convey that through linear language to type out what you're trying to say, it's not even feasible. And I do see uh, it. I do see us drifting. I, I do see us beginning to move away from kind of an obsession with the the supremacy of the written word and the supremacy of language itself. Uh, when there are so many other ways that are equally valid to communicate things. We, we were, we, 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 we um, groomed one another and decorated ourselves. So fashion and art predate language in so many ways and were primary ways of communicating. And we're doing that now more than we ever have before, communicating through those things. And I, I don't know, it, it, it kind of circles around to me for this. Um, I heard someone say on a podcast a little while back, they were talking about consciousness privilege and uh, uh, 
how an expanded consciousness or a developed consciousness was a form of privilege and then we we, we lord it over people who don't have as much etc it bothered me a little bit because i think it hit home a little bit but um uh I, I see that happening a little bit if you look at people who are engaged in this hyper merging such so deeply into a shared identity or a package set of beliefs, et cetera. Um, I think it's 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 a reaction to the overwhelm. You know, just let me merge. Let me be a part of a thing. Have an identity in that. It's this huge weight lifted off your shoulders. Uh, Richard Wright, it, it, you know, it, a group that feels good about itself is one of the most dangerous things in human history. It's it's not very often a benign or or good thing because the shadow's larger, you know, and there's so much confidence to go in a direction. So all of that just kind of I don't know. It's all swirling together a little bit in a stew for me. But um, yeah, that's it. Awesome, Adam. As usual, I appreciate your your stirrings and reflections. Um, no, I think you're you you have a very good point here, uh, and the through line is is that you know what you said right at the end about community that feels good about itself the the what is the felt sense of connecting and joining these groups it's like oh reality makes sense now you know like it it's completely organized there's an enemy there's an opposition i'm on the right side of it you know like standing up even if it's an oppressed side or or a particular minority uh group like from thinking like flat earthers for instance that's such a good example of that it's like okay, the world's not round, it's not this complex, it's, it's we're actually in this other cosmology. And there's a, an entire media bubble and community you can insulate yourself with, you know? And I think it's true for any of these, these kind of fragmented communities. There's this sense of cohesion and coherence, which they're grap grasping for. Um, and I think we should look to that. We should look to the, the cause or what, you know, what is, what is it about our world that is, um, that is lacking a sense of uh, uh, trust that we would need to escape into that, right? And I think, you know, atomization, alienization are a part of that, but they're also, there's this sort of failure of the perspectival world to really provide this uh, a sufficient ontology with sufficient trust and creative exploration to kind of go, go out there, figure this out. This is a new reality we need to sort of get inside and, and roll around in. Uh, rather, there's a kind of retreat and a retraction, as you're saying, or a contraction. So. Really good points about that. Um, I want to mention as well. Uh, yeah, the, the, Sam Hins was saying back to the mythically overdetermined iridescence of words. I don't know if you wanted to speak to that, Sam, but I, I love I love that description. I, I guess it wouldn't necessarily be a back to per se, but I'm someone mentioned Barfield earlier in this uh, this trickiness about language that's coming up in the dialogue. Um, it's been a while since I've read Barfield, but just, yeah, getting this sense that uh, this sort of late mental uh, condition that we're in, there's there's a, almost like a diffraction um, of language that sort of gets reified into, into these specified meanings where language at its root or at its core, when you trace it back, it does have that iridescence. It does have that multiplicity of meaning. But where we're heading to now, or I think where Adam was pointing to, is there's a there's a new kind of iridescence that's happening. Um, it's less, um, hmm, maybe less saturated with uh, um, the kind of coherent mythical image, but it's more it's more sliding. We're more feeling our way into it, uh, and I think that this. Uh, this reminding me of what Evan was speaking to as well. He said something in the chat that put it really nicely, but that uh, essentially we have to hold our uh, linguistic indexes lightly and really sense into one another and be very present to one another as we use the language that we have to try to get to something that the beyond the words that the words are pointing to. Um, but that kind of that seems to arise uniquely in every congregation. It seems to arise uniquely in every gathering of uh, individuals as they're trying to translate across their worlds to one another. Um, so I think, I think feeling uh, whole, what's your, what's your term, Evan? It's a, a whole body knowing, whole, yeah. Whole being sense-making. 
whole being sense making. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Oh, that's great. Uh, yeah, I, I, I like to speak to the overdeterminacy of the the mythical word, right? Because the sceptre talks about and Barfield too, right? A lot of these uh, and, and and Tolkien as well. There's a sense that uh, older, the the further back you go in in language, and we move to the sort of the oral traditions and some of the older traditions uh they're more ambiguous they have more polarities they have more multiplicities right so if you trace the etymology of language it, it becomes more mythical or it becomes magical you might have that magical numinosity and plur, uh, sort of pluralistic uh vocabulary a word can go many different directions um and and language becomes a lot more kind of straight jacketed as we kind of move into you know contemporary english but this is exploding this is this is blowing up as you're saying as the medium itself is this sort of multifaceted plastistic you know there's written word there's video there's audio there's memes there's all there's this kind of flow of different mediums that we use to communicate in and through now right so there's a kind of an intensification of language where it it is beginning to overdetermine itself again um and I would say, I would say, you know, like to, to have a kind of refinement here that this kind of intensification is a prelude maybe to an integral utterance in the sense that it's showing us its multiplicity again, but I think it requires us to be able to sort of internalize that or to fold that back in just as we would, you know, again, our relationship with the technological world, with exteriorizations, anything that culture produces, there's, there's an intensification that can only take place when we internalize these intensified environments back into ourselves. So if we can be multiplicitous, then I think our utterances will also be able to kind of bend and flow and become magic or mythic as needed or mental or a perspectival in the sense of being able to create in that sort of way. But I think that requires that in- originary intensification. And that's the question. That's always the question. It's like, well, how, how do we fold that originary intensification into ourselves spiritually, culturally, etc and fortunately or not the world is becoming so intensified that really that's the only response that will be adequate or sufficient to this crisis so we're kind of in this uh this this uh pressure cooker (laughs) to, to use um adam's description uh in which this kind of creative innovation is really being called for and being called out of us and being called into us uh, from all sides. And this is sort of the situation we're in, but I love that we've kind of moved into a conversation on language here. Um, so yeah, great, great, Sam. Uh, let's see. Anybody want to jump in who hasn't actually, Evan, do you want to jump in and then we'll, we'll go to somebody who hasn't spoken? Yeah, sorry. I, I, I don't want to hog the mic or anything, but since I got mentioned there, I just wanted to offer a bit of an interesting alternate narrative or counterpoint to this um, this uh, overdetermination of language in the past and so on. Because I think there's a really interesting thing happening now where memes specifically are actually far more similar to the language as it has been for most of our history um, at various stages. So for example, in, if, if you go back and you, you read um, the ancient Greek texts, right? There was a, a common core of the works of Homer the Iliad, the Odyssey, the Homeric hymns. And people would play with that language by using the exact same phrasing as Homer had used in some section of the Odyssey or the Iliad or the Homeric hymns, which would evoke entire clusters of shared meanings and associations through connotation without the the person having to, you know, explicitly state all of this stuff. Because anyone literate or illiterate had heard those stories recited in meter by the fire so many times that it was just the shared cultural context of everyone who spoke Greek, right? And then similarly, even as you move vastly forward in time, you had the same thing that that canon was added onto in terms of like the classical Roman authors would still riff on the Greek phrasings. And then, you know, as you move into the Christian era, this, this all was built on top of itself. And then you add, say, the Bible and all the biblical allusions. You know, you go back and read, I don't know, James Joyce or something like that, and you'll get a lot more out of it if you've actually read the Bible than if you haven't, right? And now 
there doesn't seem to be any widely shared cultural touchstone that is of the written form anymore. Maybe the closest thing we have these days is Harry Potter or Star Wars, but even there are billions of people on the planet who haven't encountered those things. So speaking of atomization, right? What's so interesting to me though, is that the way that memes are being used on online communities have this deep resonance with the way that people would riff on Homer in the ancient Greek world, right? That, that there is this sort of like using of the same, you know, meme templates, but with different words put in there, using of meme templates that riff on say the compositional visual structure of a previous meme template in a way that is like super obvious, the same way that somebody may take one of Homer's phrasings and keep the chiastic structure, but switch out certain words or whatever. You know, like you just see this like really interesting thing that's happening. And I think it's it's a sort of like, maybe the ship has sailed on written language because there's been such a combinatorial explosion of different works that are all so good. Nobody has time to read all of them. We're not gonna have a shared cultural touchstone there anymore. But this sort of novel hyper meta language of memes that's being passed around is going through, I think its own sort of like mythic phase um, of, of being, uh, you know, overdetermined perhaps, but but still it has like this really interesting similarity to like the warrior poets sitting around the campfire ripping on Homer and you know, 3000 BC or 3000 years ago, you know, 1000 BC or something like that. There's a deep similarity to that and the way that these different online communities are riffing on each other's memes, but still having the same cultural touchstones still pretty broadly shared. I mean, um, I, I just thought that was an interesting angle to bring in. And, yeah. Definitely, definitely. It's it's very McLuhan-esque, as I was, I was mentioning, about retrieval with electronic culture. It kind of brings us back to the hieroglyphic, uh, to the oral culture, right, which is participatory, is enfolded, as you're talking about. All those things are, are kind of coming back through electronic media. Um, you know, I, I think, and, and Joyce really, we need to go no further than Joyce and, uh, and, and Finnegan's Wake, perhaps, in the sense of, um, and I brought this up in, in the Gepser course as well as a really interesting parallel to what Gepser talks about and the kind of intensification of just bringing forward any of these structures, not just at will, but as needed in the kind of intelligence of the present, right? Um, but Joyce has this great line, I, I can't recall it offhand, but he's, you know, he's, he's talking about, um, McLuhan is talking about Joyce in Finnegan's Wake, discussing the colloidoroscope of all of these different mediums of communication and history and the Crow Magnon's charter and bringing up all of this different interesting poetic language to evoke all, the whole history of communication mediums, the whole history of cultural evolution, just sort of present in this individual as he's moving through the world. And this is a kind of an image. I think this is sort of a planetary image or a planetary mythology, one of the ones that we can actually invoke in the 20th century that McLuhan um, was pointing out through through uh, through Joyce, in which that you know we are this highly plasticistic being, which brings forth the whole wealth of and the whole plenum in the history of consciousness. Um, you know the, the fact that our media is doing this now is is a wonderful sign. I would say, like again, maybe an intensification in the near future is the capacity for the internet not to, not to merely reference itself in its own memes, but can that intensify to such a degree that the internet, online and offline the human world and the non-human world and then all of its wealth of history can fold into our language and our being and, and can can there be a kind of um a perspectivity so that online offline uh, uh dichotomy is finally broken i think that's one of the last holdovers of cartesian perspective perspectival thinking in this sort of the internet is this great cauldron of uh, electronic media and cultural evolution. And yet there's still this sort of bicameral um, schism in the material embodied world. And so I would be very interested to see how we can kind of fold that back into the world, right? That's that would be an intensification for me. Anyway, and that's what I'm very interested in. But um, yeah, awesome, Evan, great. This is a great stimulating conversation. Really appreciate it. Uh, Adam, do you want to jump in? Uh, yeah, so so I've been kind of holding off listening to everyone and every the, yes, you're correct. This conversation is fan, fantastic. So so for me, um, this ties right into like really the whole conversation here is this intensity of theme. Um, so I've been really doing a lot of practices around time and you know the time being and um, and experiencing 
like through this through, through these practices this this um it's like synchronicity is the best best way i can describe it is where this the themes kind of come about through different media sources where like if i'm talking to someone about whitehead <clears throat> i'm seeing a post i'm seeing you know like a conversation over here i'm different different media sources are all coming in from different different angles and i'm all ex I'm experiencing whitehead and, and it's really creating like a very robust conversation around it even though i'm not having these conversations one-on-one -on -one in particular with any person but it's informing the conversation and and ultimately it comes in in different media forms so like for me that's that's really the um you know the crux of my whole year has been this intensity around theme um, and especially around transparency as well, because if you look at it, everyone, like everyone's wearing their worldview on their sleeve right now, you know, you, you know where everyone stands. And so everyone's just kind of speaking, you know, their ultimate, you know, their ultimate ideology, their truth and, you know, come what may, they don't care who they hurt. And that's causing an intensity and, in, you know, connections in certain spheres and in disconnections in other spheres. Like I've got family members that, you know, that I know how they feel now. And so I've, more reticent to you know to have you know relationships with them so so yeah so intensity all the way around has been like just a huge you know a huge running theme through whether it's intensity of moments or transparency or in you know themes of of information gathering or whatever so yeah it's been interesting awesome adam yeah i'm I'm also, I'm also going to post and, and, and chime in with, with Tom here that uh, your Origin Project community is, is a wonderful space that you've been curating this year. It's really kind of come to life. Uh, so I'm pointing folks to that. There's a Facebook uh, page and there's also a home page. Um, let's see if I can grab that too. All right, thank you for that. Exploring yeah, we've been doing a, having a lot of really great conversations over there. And, you know, so, so it was a really great place to curate a lot of these really interesting ideas and, and being able to explore them, you know. Um, so, yeah, thank you so much for that. Oh, of course, of course. Mm -hmm. uh, happy to continue to strengthen the rhizomatic connections here. Um, but, yeah, no, I think I think the themes you, you mentioned are very important here, especially transparency. Um, uh, it, it, uh, and transparency is a kind of multifaceted and inexhaustive word that we could explore and go down a rabbit hole on. But I think, you know, the themes that you're bringing up are, uh, you know, speak to me in terms of really getting a sense of, you know, the funny thing is we've been separated, everybody, like, you know, we haven't gotten a chance to hang out this year. Uh, I know Adam lives in Florida somewhere, you know, but we haven't had the chance to actually converge in person. But there's been a kind of transparency about like, what are we all doing here, right? Like, what what are, what are we showing up for and connecting with each other for? Like that that has been very clear, you know? It's like, we, we've all been on retreat and just in a kind of space of, of a, a thinness between each other and the world and kind of a holding pattern in that. But I think the benefit of it has been this sense of, of uh, mutual appreciation for one another. And I'm just very excited for where we're gonna go and, and maybe not in the immediate 2021, I know it's going to take some time for, for the pandemic to subside. Um, but I am, I am very much looking forward to the ways in which we're going to converge in the coming year. So yeah. Thank you, Adam. Thank you. Great. Any, let's see, Christian, do you want to jump in? And we, we got a couple more minutes to ask a few more questions and bring some more comments in. Yeah, I'll keep it short so that we can get some more. And uh, this is the first time I've attended um, a mutation salon, so happy to be here and see a bunch of new faces. Um, a, f a few things have kind of popped into my mind after the last few shares. Um, well, I was kind of turning around in my mind this idea that you brought up, Jeremy, of like better folding in the uh, the, the digital newosphere, I don't know if you'd use these same terms, but like into our sense of self or bridging the dichotomy or, or erasing the, uh, the barrier or something like that. I'm curious to hear more about exactly what you mean in that regard. But as Adam was sharing, uh, something else along those lines came up for me with this issue of transparency. And I it's, it seems very true that there is in many ways, I would say like a greater ideological transparency. Um, and I think it's the, maybe it's the same thing that affords people to be internet bullies, that kind of like uh, distance that, and that, that kind of disconnection 
um, in this, these online social spaces that, you know, you're kind of like, fuck it. I'm just going to say whatever's on my mind. And people are, are a little more like eager to, uh, or, or willing to just say what the, the thoughts they carry around with them when it's on their Facebook, rather to someone's face, because you don't have to deal with the somatic dissonance feedback that happens when there's a point of contention in person, right? It's just kind of, on the other hand, I've found that that same distance has been for myself and other people, a, a path towards uh, healing certain things. Like, like I found that I've been able to engage in points of contention with people um, without feeling as triggered because there's like this like digital buffer, so to speak. Um, and that's like allowed me to titrate the experience of um, being with whatever's happening in my body somatically in, in a way that's more manageable because it's not as strong. Um, and I, I, I wonder if like, I guess maybe I'll, I'll phrase it as a question that's more alive for me is how how we can be more deeply transparent because our ideologies and our surface emotions aren't really the depths of who we are. So I'm seeing like, you know, the thoughts and like upper level feelings of people who I, I uh, that I didn't previously um, have uh, that kind of awareness of like who they were inside, but I'd still don't know them like in a deep, deep way. Um, and so I'm interested in, online technologies, which might allow for like this deeper contact through the medium, um, perhaps creating spaces where people can, you know, that basically therapeutic online spaces and how the medium can be used um, for that purpose. Mm. Yeah, that's a very, very interesting uh, question there about what, what technology can actually do to enhance intimacy, connection, depth, with one another and with the world. As you were talking, I was thinking about, you know, that Rilke line about, you know, the interior skies of every individual and that birds pass through us, you know, in our interior sky, there's a kind of a depth and intimacy there that um, maybe as, as a potential integral expression of the technosphere, you know, it might allow us to have that kind of depth. I would say, I would, I would lean into, um, you know, some of the, the best examples, even on Zoom this year, I think we've had a lot of in this particular community, but I've seen it in other communities as well, a sense of a sense of depth with each other. It's very difficult, I think, to reach that point. But it does it does kind of shine forward or shine through occasionally. So I, I'd be interested in hearing more about that as well. I would just say, um, in terms of uh, uh, technology and uh, sort of like potential of, of technology to kind of fold into the material world. Um, I wouldn't say just material. I would say it's also this sense of folding into our the depths of our interiority, right, in the depths of the world, um, that intimate intimate sky that Rilke talks about. I think technology can be a tool in, in, in aiding us like, like an utterance, like language itself. I think technology and the media environments we create can help assist that. Um, that linkage or connection or intimacy. But again, the, tr the trick is how. But I would point to, um, actually, just to, to give you a, an example on a more mundane sense, uh, Amber Case's work in cyborg anthropology, and she's very influenced by Donna Haraway, but Amber Case herself is very, um, oh, Adam, see, see you later, Adam. Uh, Amber Case is very much uh, inspired by Haraway's work on cyborg anthropology and allowing, in a similar way to like Bateson, Nora Bateson, with warm data, she's very interested in um, ambient technology, technology that enhances our sense of presence, that uh, works with the human biorhythms, that works with the human sense of time, and isn't so, you know, forcing us to conform to technological rhythms or the always onness of the internet, et cetera. So ambient technology or ambient, ambient tech is very interesting. And that's really just scratching the surface of the work she's doing with, uh, with cyborg anthropology, but I would look her up. Um, she has a great interview. I'm going to post it here. If you're curious, um, Amber case, Hold on, let me just get the link here. She has a great interview that just was posted recently on a future podcast. Um, I don't tend to listen to a lot of futurists, but 
Amber case is, is an exception. Um, here, you know what? I'm just gonna. No, actually, uh, I'll post it later. I need to find the right one, but Amber case, and I'll type her in the chat here. Um, so thank you, Krishna. Let's see. Uh, anybody who hasn't gone yet, would anybody like to speak who who hasn't jumped in yet before we uh, before we close for the day? Include our session. Any reflections and intensifications? Mora. I, I would like to uh, say, uh, addressing Christian's point, that uh, for me, this year of attending the Gebser course and cohering the radical um, have definitely been a deepening, and, and there is a perceived intimacy with each of you. And listening to people's comments and resonating in my body with those comments and um, the feeling of, gosh, I wonder what so-and-so is doing <laughs> over New Year's. I mean, you know, the ordinary life as well. And um, so, uh, Jeremy, uh, this intensification in a... Um, heartwarming and positive and physically bioregenerative way has been very profound. And I have such thanks to you and to all of the participants and how much my mind is stretched. I love it. Thank you. Oh, Happy, New Happy New Year. <laughs> Happy New Year. Thank you. Uh, Richard, do you want to jump in for a moment? Yeah. And thank you, Maura. Yeah, ju just very quickly. Thank you, Maura. Uh, just very quickly, again, to address Christian's point um, of the therapeutic possibility. Um, you know, I'm a, I'm a coach and I do a lot of one on one via Zoom um, coaching, which is an intimate relationship if it works well. And I would say that there are ways in which the one-on-one -on, -one on Zoom can become more intimate than the old import, in, the old in-person type of coaching was concerned. It becomes more intimate by intensification of one sense over the others. It, it, it obliges you to hear voice. There's, you know, you think I'm looking at a screen, but in, but I find when it works, it's because you're much more attentive to the voice you're hearing, to the cadences, to the construction of sentences and so on, than you are in person where there are in fact more distractions, you know, there's visual distraction, there's, there's, I mean, the best Zoom coaching sessions are actually with a blank background. You know, there's no distraction at all. You and what I, I guess what I'm trying to say is you have to find one thing that could be more intense over Zoom than it might be in person. And in that way, you can find a depth, a therapeutic or relationship or intimate depth that you might not find otherwise. So I guess, Christian, the question is, how can how can that be transferred away and and more common use than a for pay type professional relationship, which is a very interesting question, you know, that people could achieve that therapeutic or relationship intimacy deliberately using, uh, using just Zoom as an example. I don't know if that makes sense, but I have found it actually to be more intimate uh, more often than in-person settings have. Yeah, there's that there's that sense of like a healthy separation, actually, right? A healthy distance is us using it efficiently rather than deficiently, right? And it's yeah. tricky territory, but I think you're it, it is. That's what I am, and I'm, and I'm trying to say it. You intensify one aspect of it over uh, trying to intensify or perceive all aspects of it. I guess yeah. that's what I'm trying to crudely say. Yeah. And this is true here too. You know, you can turn the thing off. Just listen to people intently, and you will get a lot out of it. Mm -hmm. Agreed, Christian. Did you want to follow up really quickly to that, and then I'll make a few closing and uh, announcements for the new year, just forthcoming. 
Yeah, quickly, I just want to say I resonate very much with what you're saying, Richard. And as my, um, you know, Zoom interactions have carried on through the year, I find myself wanting to sink more into the voice than with the tiny little square uh, on the screen. And uh, it's kind of become like a little practice for me where I just pay attention to the voice and I almost like feel like a holographic sense of presence in front of me. Um, and that might be like an interesting psychotechnology to develop as a group practice where you maybe close your eyes or something, but yeah, thank you for the feedback. It's got um, inspiring ideas in my mind. Fantastic. Well, thank you, Christian. And thank you everybody for a wonderful session. Uh, is this the best way to end the new, uh, the, the, the new, year? I'm calling this year zero. Um, and that's part of the, uh, the, the announcements, uh, there will be very shortly, very imminently, some announcements from Mutations Anthology. Um, it's a book, a little periodical that we're going to start publishing in the new year. And we're starting with year zero, issue zero of 2020, even though it's going to be distributed in 2021. Um, but yeah, so that, so we have a journal now, which is really great. And if you are interested in writing something or contributing something, please keep in touch with me. Um, it's going to be published through Integral Imprint, which some of you are already I've already heard of um, the big formal announcements. We have the logo design done. It's a formal imprint now through Revelor, um, but Mutations is a periodical. I think we're going to be um, coming out with it twice a year. And um, so, yeah, I'm really looking forward to to uh, entering into that and um, really kind of getting involved in that process. And if, you've, if you're on uh, the Patreon with me, then you will see some of the early images and design work for it. I'm going to be posting that soon. Uh, Sean Kelly's book is also imminently going to be announced, Becoming Gaia on the Threshold of Planetary Initiation. It's a fantastic book. It's going to be a little book. It's going to be bigger than my book, be a little long, uh, taller, but it's still a little book. We're going with the small form factor. Um, my class, which is the February uh, Gepser class, we read through Ever Present Origin, that is also about to be announced, um, maybe tonight, if I can get everything done in time. Uh, and open registration. Um, so look for that in the next 24, 48 hours. Uh, and finally, in terms of guests, I, I would love to do more open events like this for mutations in January and February and in the new year, but we also have some guests lined up. So look forward to folks like Adam Ray Atkins talking about the acid left, Mark Fisher and Temporix. We're gonna kind of be riffing together on Mark Fisher and Gene Gepser because Temporix is the theme. Uh, similarly, Andrew McLuhan is also going to be joining uh, Mutations for an episode, uh, talking about his work with the McLuhan Institute, Cultural Evolution, and again, the legacy of, of the McLuhans and how that might relate to Eugene Gepser's work. So really kind of an exploration together. Um, we're going to have Barbara Carlson back to continue a conversation series on integral embodiment. And we're definitely going to have Sean Kelly on to talk about his book. So all of that in the new year in the coming weeks in January. And thank you again for, for a wonderful session and really just a wonderful year. And just you guys have all made this such a rich community to be a part of, and I'm, I'm grateful. So, okay. See you in the new year and have, have a great New Year's. Take care, everybody. Bye. Bye, everyone.